Okay, I hope each one of you has a copy of the scriptures that I plan to be using this morning for <coughs> our message. And I've entitled our message this morning, The Persistence of Unbelief. The Persistence of Unbelief. We all have a problem with that. And this is directed to all of us. This is a case during our Lord's ministry that our text takes place. And we're going to read, if you will, let's read uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 17. And one of the multitude answered and said, <clears throat> Master, speaking to Jesus, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, the demons out, and they could not. I don't know if you've ever seen an individual like that that fell in the street and would go to foaming at the mouth, but I've seen that, and perhaps you have over the years. Verse 19. Jesus answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring the boy unto me. And they brought him unto Jesus, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said of a child, My boy's had this since he was a little boy. And oftentimes he did cast him into the fire, and into the waters, to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Do you really care? Can you help us? Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thy mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thy dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And our text deals with our Lord performing one of his many miracles that he performed while he was on this earth. And in the process of doing this, he pointed out to them their lack of faith. But he nailed it when he said in verse 23, and that's what it really what I want us to focus on today. Once again, verse 23. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Amen. Let that soak in. All things. One place our Lord said, you can say to yonder mountain, be removed. And if you've got the faith, that mountain will be removed. Is that right? Didn't he say that? But he said, if, if I can't believe. Now this father was desperate. This was his boy, his son. So he brought him to Christ. And he was in a helpless condition. He was taken by this spirit that would cause him to... Uh, in fact, when I was in high school... We had a little concession stand across the street from school. We had a break time. And one day as I started across the street, there was a boy that we were in our class that fell. And 
I thought, well, he slipped and fell, but he had this spirit. He was foaming at the mouth. He had a some kind of a seizure. And I remember some of them said, well, grab his tongue. Don't let him swallow his tongue. Because anything then was possible, I, I assume. But this young man was similar to this, what I've described. But his father was a believer with unbelief. Verse 24, right where the father cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thy mine unbelief. Lord, what's lacking? I need it. Would you not give it to me? And Jesus had said that all things were possible to him that believeth. But over and over in the scripture, the Lord promises us, whatsoever you ask in my name, meaning in my will, I'll give it to you. Now, folks, this is the one that owns all things. He said, all the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. He owns all the gold and the silver. The Bible says the Lord's hand is not shortened. That he cannot say. He's well able to do what he says he'll do. And if you don't realize it or not, our Lord wants to give his children good things. I don't preach, as you've heard people say, the prosperity gospel. But I do believe that the Lord wants his children to enjoy good things. Sometimes he keeps those things from us that we think good for our own good. But I believe, like he is our Heavenly Father, that he owns everything and he can give us as he would. And I believe he's like a, our earthly parents who want to provide the best for us our children, and we seek to do that. But this man realized when he brought his boy to, to the Lord that something was lacking, else the boy would already have been healed. And we see our Lord as he cast the demons out of this young man. But I've heard of these so-called faith healers and the people come uh, miles from everywhere to, to go to these faith healers that claim they can heal the body. Now folks, there's nothing beyond the Lord's power. There's nothing that he cannot do. And we call on him to do those things. But these faith healers, the ones that I'm acquainted with, have missed the whole purpose. The Lord healed when he was on this earth for a reason, a particular reason. You remember? He healed so he, that you could understand that he had power to forgive sin. That was his number one motive for healing. Matter of fact, during his ministry, there were some that he came in contact with that he healed that were born afflicted because one day they knew the Lord was going to come along and he was going to heal them. But that healing was for the purpose of showing that he had power to forgive sin.
But there's many believers like this man in the past that had faith, but they still lacked faith. And I'll use an example, the man called Abraham. The man that was called the father of the faithful. Sarah, his wife, came to him and said, Abraham, God's forgotten the promise that he made that he was going to give us a son. So I want you to take Hagar, my servant, and I want you to have a child by her. <coughs> We've covered this a lot long ago. In a different atmosphere. But Abraham, trying to do God's business, took Hagar and had a child by her. Ishmael. But this was not the one that God promised. But here was a man, the father of the faithful, doubting that God was going to fulfill his promise. He was 100 years old when God fulfilled that promise and Isaac was born. Then there was a time where God said to King David, that he wanted him to go into battle. And that David said, wait a minute, God, I better count the soldiers first and see if we're able to win that battle. Man, he had the Lord on his side. But the Lord rebuked him because he doubted God's power. What I'm really pointing out to you is that we all have something in us that, that has a lack of of faith. You remember when our Lord was here on earth and he had walked on water out to the disciples and then along came Peter and he likewise walked on water. But he said, wait a minute, what am I doing walking on water? <laughs> He went beneath the surface of the water. Peter believed, but he had something about him that was still a shallow faith. He didn't believe strong enough, did he? Before what I'm trying to provoke you and I, and particularly myself, when I, when I preach to y'all, I've already tried it on myself. is a stronger faith in our God that's able to do what he said he'll do. But met a lot of believers that have still been shallow on their faith. Then there's some unbelievers in the past Moses was called of God and God said, Moses, I want you to go in and lead my people out of Egypt. Moses said, what, what am I going to say to Pharaoh? Who am I going to say that sent me? And God said to Moses, you tell him that I am that I am hath sent you. Moses did what God told him to do. He told Pharaoh that God said let his people go. You remember what Pharaoh said? Who is God? 
that I should obey his voice. Pharaoh got bigger than God, at least he thought he was bigger. You don't fear God, he said, fear me, is what he was telling Moses. And there was Herod that had John the Baptist's head cut off The Lord sent a pack of worms and they devoured the body of Herod. But there was a man by the name of Belshazzar who was a grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Belshazzar was having a party, the Bible says. And he wanted to impress his people. He got to thinking, what can I do to impress them? And he dawned on him. He said, you know that the temple that we carried away from Jerusalem and those holy Bethels, we've got them stored in there and, and God said we can't touch them. Don't bother the vessels. I want you all to use those vessels. We're going to get drunk with them. And they started drinking out of the forbidden things of the temple. And all of a sudden, there was a quietness. And there was the fingers of a man's hand appeared on the wall. Just a hand. It says, many, many people of Harrison. The Bible says that Belshazzar needs to begin to do that. He was so extremely afraid of what he had seen. He called his wise men and he said, what does this many, many tickle of Harrison mean? But Daniel came and said, you've had it, boy. You did what God said not to do. You took the forbidden temple vessels Therefore, your days are numbered. And at that very time, the Medes, the Persians, were burrowing under the river there, and they came in and destroyed and killed Belshazzar that very day. And yet, Belshazzar was going to show God. And then, folks, the people in Noah's day were a people of unbelief. I want to remind you all something. To not believe something doesn't change the fact. You all remember that. We may not believe something, but it does not change the truth, does it? The people of Noah's day, the Bible says, that every imagination of his heart was only evil continually. He thought evil. They went just as far from God as you can get. And God sent Noah and his sons to save the human race. And they preached for 120 years to the people of that day. And that people rejected the message that was preached. <coughs> and they perished in the flood. But folk, I'm persuaded that today, among you and I, we have a lack of faith. Now, I put on your paper next, if you'll turn with me there, uh, Hebrews 10, verse 25 and 26. Look at this real close. And this is written to people that believe, not unbelievers. All right, to believers, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see 
the day, meaning the end time approaching. Now look, verse 26 goes along with that. For if we sin willfully, now what sin is he talking about? He's talking about the forsaking of the assembling of ourselves together. A bunch of people say, I don't need church. <coughs> Read the Lord's word. For if we sin willfully, after that we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Brother L. Chester Gwynn, who wrote our Sunday school quarters for years, preached a message that when I was in seminary many years ago. He called it the unpardonable sin of a Christian. Many he's going to pay for it some way or another. Not forsaking the assembly. People say, well, it's my time. I can do what I want to do. Well, you're right. But I'm going to tell you this much. It's not your time. The Lord gave us the time. He allotted us while we're here. None of us know how long we're going to be here. On our prayer list today is Ryan Carlisle name. Youth pastor Greg at Longview Missionary Baptist Church. <coughs> Working out last week, exercising at the gym. And he finished his exercise getting dressed. He died with a heart attack. 38 years old. Every breath that you breathe is a gift from God. You're going to report back to him for how you use those breaths that he's blessed us with. But I mentioned here uh, when Paul wrote the Hebrews about Apparently it was in those days true that some of them were forsaking the assembly then in those days. Our Lord tells us that in the last day there's going to come a great falling away. By that we mean people are going to quit serving the Lord. They're going to quit assembling themselves together as the Lord told them to. Churches today have to try every trick they can to entertain people to get them to come. i tell you why you need to be in the church. Because the church is bought by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church is his means of carrying on his business on the earth. He said to the church when he was leaving, ye are the light of the world. When he was here, he was the light. But he left his business into our hands. People need to go to church because they love the Lord. And when they stop and realize that God is the author of life, that as the scripture says and describes, in him we live and move and have our being. But folk, it's a matter of lack of belief. Our soul winners go out and they knock on doors. One of the first questions they ask people that open the door, one of the first questions they ask, if you died tonight, you realize, would you be going to heaven? And the response they get is, well, I'm a pretty good person. 
That's probably the number one thing. Not too bad. Help my neighbor out. But folks, if you and I really believed it strong enough that there is an eternity to face, either with the Lord or apart from the Lord, can't be both places. And then not but two places. But he lets us choose, doesn't he? He's already paid the price that you and I cannot pay with the blood of the only begotten Son of God. And folk, people are going out into eternity either to live with God forever or to be tormented day and night forever and ever. Do you believe that? We need to embrace it and believe it stronger than what we have shown in the past. Folk, either the Lord is the Lord or he's not. He is our Savior or he's not. He's either our Savior or the biggest fraud that ever existed. And I'm going to claim the Savior. You can call him a fraud if you want. All right. I want to skip down to the last verse. We won't take time for the other. Isaiah 45, verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth, for I'm God, and there is none else. Folk, either he's God or he's not. There's no in between. But you get to do with him as you will. He says to us, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I'm going to conclude our thoughts. The Lord had performed all these miracles, He had just fed several thousand. And he began to talk pretty strong language to them. And they said, this is a hard saying. We can't understand what he's saying. So it says they turned away from him. The multitude did. And they walked with him no more. Where'd all these people go that was eating that little bunch of lunch? They're gone. And they never did return. The masses were never found again where our Lord was. And when they left, the Lord looked over to Peter. And he said, Peter, wilt thou also go away? Peter answered rightly. He said, where, where can we go? Where, where can we go? There's no other place but our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Y'all got any better, other way figured out? So there's none other way, is it? There's none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, 12. None other name. Through him and him alone. So, folks, I want you to...
embrace the thought we started with where the man said to the Lord, Lord, I, I believe you. Help that part of me that don't believe. Lord, make me a stronger believer. Oh, that's what we need. I was watching service this past week where these guys were picking up them rattlesnakes and tossing them around. And they were interviewing some of these guys tossing old snakes around over in West Virginia. But I can tell you this much. <laughs> I think they were tempting God. I think God gave us sense enough to leave those poisonous reptiles alone. But they said it took a whole lot of faith and a lot of stupidity to pick up those poisonous, venomous snakes for no good reason. But they must have believed it. The handle of some of them had 10, 12 snakes in the hand at one time. Here this morning, you haven't put your faith in our Lord, as your Lord. And I plead to you today to simply take care of business while you can. Trust the Lord as your Savior, and you'll never regret it. You'll get to live with Him forever. 